cats and groovy chicks and finger popping daddies. I'm your alter dominant ego man. You can call me Mr. Ego if you like me. Well, well, anyway. You know, the K.A., she doesn't like me telling stories about him, but anyway. You know, he played with the famous bass player, Jim Crow. <laughs> I love that mistake so much that I'm going to keep it in there. He didn't play with Jim Crow, he played with Bill Crow. Bill Crow, who played with Stan Getz. Well, anyway, he played with Bill Crow, and Bill Crow told him on the gig that the first time he played with Stan Getz, he got up there, and his E string broke. And uh, so he didn't know what to do. He couldn't play. Anyway, there was, so the, another bass player came in to sit in on the gig, and he had a, a bass, and he said, well, can I borrow your bass? So he said, okay, you can borrow my bass. So he got the bass in his hands, and he started playing, and he realized that the bass player he had borrowed the bass from was left-handed. So everything was backwards on the strings. So he had to get through the whole gig of Stan Getz at his first gig playing the bass backwards. How about that one? <laughs> That's almost as good as the second story, which has to do with Hank Jones. Hank Jones hired Bill Crow to play a gig with him. And they rehearsed in the afternoon. He had all their music written out, so they were all ready. he was all ready for the gig. He got up on the stage, and uh, he realized that Hank Jones had written all the music in red ink. And what happened is they turned on the stage lighting, which was red. And all the ink disappeared, so he had he couldn't see anything on the music at all. He had to fake the whole gig. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I'm telling you. Oh, here comes the KH. He doesn't like me telling stories on him. Here he comes. I gotta go. Bye bye. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Jazz Ranch. Hip cats, groovy chicks, and finger popping daddies. And you know, I'm sorry about the alter dominant man. You know, he actually uh, butted in. He tries to upstage me. And you know, but that's a true story about um, Bill Crow. I did, he did tell me those two uh, incidents that he had, and they're pretty funny. So I like to retell them myself. Anyway, I have something special for you this evening, and it is talking about upper structure chords. In other words, how you find ninths and sharp elevens and thirteenths, but in particular thirteenths and flat nines by using just a construction in your hands of a dominant seventh in the left and a triad in the right. They're, they're called upper structure triads and they create a real jazz sound. And if you learn these and learn how to use them, you will really sound like a jazz pianist, what the jazz pianists do harmonically. So here we go with upper structure chords and triads. Here we go.
Now, in this video, I want to show you how to find a very hip sounding chord, which has upper extensions. That just means we are adding flat 9, sharp 11, 13, that type of thing, above the, the dominant 7th chord. So if it's a C7, root 3rd, 5th, 7th. Now we could add a 9 there, 9. We could add 11 here, 13 here. Or we can add a sharp 11 there and have that with a dominant 7. That's more common. I'm going to show you just the 13 and the flat 9, which are important. Like that. So root 3rd, flat 7, flat 9, 13. Now, if you look at this up here, what it is, it's a, a triad inverted, right? It's an A chord, A inverted into the first inversion. Root position, first inversion, second inversion. So that first inversion now with the C7, that allows us to have the dominant seventh here and also a fourth voicing here, which is really nice. You can go up here too and you can get two fourth voicings. You can go and have an augmented fourth voicing here and a perfect fourth voicing there. So that's maybe even a hipper sound. Now, with that I can go like this, chromatically down one note at a time, going through the cycle of fifths like this. Right. Now this progression is a 2-5 moving to another 2-5, down through the cycle. In other words, this is, we can think of it as C, C minor 7 to F7 to B flat minor 7 to E flat 7, like that, two fives. But it isn't a, the first chord is not a minor 7, it's a, it's a dominant 7th with a 13 flat 9. The next one goes to another dominant 7th, in other words, 2-5, that'd be the 5, and the 5 has a sharp 9, flat seven, there's the sharp nine, and the fifth. Then it goes to another dominant seven with the 13 flat nine, another dominant seven that's sharp nine, and so on. It goes through, through the cycle like that. You see, now, so you want to understand that these are actually chords that are very simple in the right hand. They're triads. This is an A triad inverted. The next one becomes an A flat triad inverted. So now you can do some interesting things with this, you know, like um, in terms of improvisation, you can begin to do things like this. different than just playing on the regular scale. Now you're expanding the sounds and you're doing it with triads in the right hand and with dominant sevenths in the left hand. Yeah, so I picked out the song Like Someone in Love as a good example to apply this concept of stack chords based on a dominant seventh and the sixth away, the sixth step of the... In other words, C7 and an A chord. If you were apply it to an F chord, then it'd be, be a D chord against an F7, right? So here we go. I'm going to show you where they, on Like Someone in Love, where they fall. Right here now is the first one. A7, C with an F sharp triad. minor. There's the second one. It's an A flat against an F chord, right? Now here's the next one, a G7 against an E chord. So let's get that. 
is a tritone substitute. Now here's some parallel fourths. Now here's another one. C7 against an A chord. You see these are very hip sounds. Tritone substitute here. Now there's the next one. D against the B flat, right? That's the flat six. There it is. E against the G G7 chord. chord here and there's there it is there A against F sharp there it is again G G7 against E and again G against E so that's a very important chord voicing to be able to know about and it's easy to find it by seeing the relationship of the root to the six chord. In other words, C to A or G to E. So I could do this. I could go down through the series of, of dominant sevens like this. Or I could go through a cycle of fifths like this. even hipper. Now wrapping up, if you like this video and you've learned something from it, please write to me because I will do step two next. Because the first step would be to take the dominant seventh and apply the sixth chord. Next one would be apply the flat six like this. And then how to use that. And the next one would be, would be to apply the flat five, or the two, actually the two, really. We have this, that sound. And then the next one would be the flat five, like this. They're all jazz sounding chords with triads on the top. You see, this is with the six, this is with the flat six. Now we can invert them to sound better, like, might sound better like this. That's the six, this is the flat six. This would be the two. And this would be the flat five. You see, they're all jazz sounding chords. Let's, let's break them down this way, like. That's a C7, 13 flat nine, right? And this is a C7 sharp nine flat 13. This one is a C7 with a ninth and a sharp 11 and a 13th. And this one is a C7 with a flat 9, a sharp 11, and a flat 7. So you have those four varieties. You can apply these to all your songs that you're learning. Signing off from the Jazz Ranch. Thanks so much for tuning in and watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you want to hear part two, please write to me because I will do a part two and, and talk about another, another system of chords and upper structure chords. So until next time, I will say in the words of my great friend, Hermie Dresser, who's up there looking down at us with pity. Swing loose! And we'll see you next time around. Bye-bye.